On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with Robert Perry about his book, Signs. A CMPE, which stands for a conjunction of meaningfully parallel events, it's basically an extreme form of synchronicity. Most of our paranormal events that we're studying now, they're inner experiences with hopefully a veridical component, but in the end, they say they seem to say something about our abilities um, or our ultimate nature being perhaps immaterial, but with signs or CMPEs, they, their statements seem to be more about something other than us that seems to be, you know, giving us messages. I'm just not quite sure that we can make that last leap because there's this whole idea, one of time that we talked about in precognition, but also just in terms of being you and I and whoever being co-creators of our reality. So we get back to this idea of what's reality and how is reality being created and experienced? And again, what's our relationship to time? Are we in the future creating our reality of the past? I mean, you know, we, we shouldn't act like anything's definitive yet. However, I think that there is a contemporary bias, um, even among those of us who are into the paranormal, a bias against sort of agents that are beyond the human. Um, you know, maybe uh, if, if we take NDE seriously, for instance, it looks like that experience um, involves a certain amount of initiative from the other side. Maybe something coming to the human level from the other side is part of how life works. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we're going to look at synchronicity in a new way, in a scientific way. Our guest is Robert Perry. I think the interview's pretty self-explanatory. Let's get right to it. Today, we welcome back to Skeptico, Robert Perry. Robert's here to talk about his book, Signs, A New Approach to Coincidence, Synchronicity, Guidance, Life Purpose, and God's Plan. And he's also here to tell us about a pilot study he's done about this work, along with Dr. Bruce Grayson, that is suggestive that he really is onto something here. So, Robert, thank you for joining me. Welcome back. Oh, it's a great pleasure. I'm very honored to be here. I love the show and, and listen every week. Super, and I, I really appreciate you've made some great contributions on uh, in the forum and on the and some on the comment section of the website. I always look forward to reading your posts, so it's great to have you back on. So I have to say this book you've written, it's amazing. It's kind of startling when you get into it because you claim to have uncovered a rather remarkable new paranormal phenomena that you've coined CMPE. So there's a lot here to kind of wrap our arms around. Why don't you start by telling us what you think you've uncovered here? Okay. Uh, basically, uh, a CMPE, which stands for a conjunction of meaningfully parallel events. I, I call it a sign for short, but because I use that word in a very non-standard way, uh, hardly anybody else calls it those. Um, CMPE seems to be the, the handle of choice. It's basically an extreme form of synchronicity. Now, synchronicity tends to be an extremely subjective thing. There's almost no rule for what constitutes a synchronicity. But the pattern that we typically associate with synchronicity is two events coming together and sharing some striking similarity. The, the classic case is uh, Carl Jung's scarab story, where a patient is telling him about a dream in which she's given a gold scarab. And as she does, a gold scarab beetle is tapping at the, the window of Young's office. So there you have two events, her telling the dream, the appearance of the scarab, and they both share one striking parallel, which is a golden scarab. Right, and, and on the more just kind of day-to-day -day synchronicities that we're all familiar with, So, but you're going to take the way beyond that. Right. It's, it's a much more extreme version of that basic pattern. You, you, you still have two events, 
that just happen to come together in time. They aren't brought together intentionally because of their similarity. And with this phenomenon, there are rules about how close together in time they need to be. These two events are still strikingly similar, but rather than one parallel between them, like the golden scarab, they actually share a long list of parallels that are objective that any observer can see. Um, and on average, I find they share about eight or nine parallels. Examples. Go ahead. Give us a couple. Well, I'll give you one. It, it, they're, they're kind of long in the telling because of, of, of all this, the similarities between the events. But uh, the, one example is uh, last August I was finishing the draft of the paper on our pilot study that, that you mentioned uh, on CMPEs. And the, the paper reports on us taking a paranormal experience, synchronicity, that's extremely difficult to study because of how subjective subjective it is, and finding a way to objectively measure it so that we can then do an initial scientific study on it. Our study happened to work better than we expected, and we were in fact able to show that something measurable is going on. So within seconds of writing the last line of that draft, I pick up Steve Volk's book, Fringology, which I thought was a great book, and I began a new chapter that I hadn't looked ahead to. And this chapter was on the work of Dr. Andrew Newberg, who was famous for his research into the brain states associated with uh, spiritual experiences like meditation. And in that chapter, Volk tells the story of Newberg's first experiment. And Volk says, the activity of meditation has always been supremely difficult to study. The experience of meditation is purely subjective, happening only in the practitioner's mind. But Newberg thought he may have figured out a way to study it scientifically with no faith-based assumptions, and he did it by measuring what's going on in the brain of someone who's in a meditative state. And the results were everything he wanted. Um, they showed a measurable and logical correlation between the experience of the meditator and what was going on in his brain. And so I, I just felt that that was extremely similar to what I had just written, and so I wrote a list of, of parallels, and I can read them to you if you like. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so in both events, my paper and uh, the chapter in Fringology, there is some paranormal or spiritual experience, in one case synchronicity, in the other meditative experience that's been around for ages. It's extremely, it's, it's said to be extremely or supremely, quote, difficult to study, and that phrase is in both things, because of how subjective it is. Uh, Number three, a researcher comes up with a way to study it scientifically without faith-based assumptions. Number four, he conducts the first test ever done. Number five, prominent in this, in this test is someone named Robert. In Newbert's test, it was the subject that was named Robert. Number six, being the first test, the researcher is not sure it will work, but the results are either better than expected, in our case, or, quote, all he could, all he could reasonably have wanted, in the other case. Number seven, these results in some sense validate the experience, at least showing that something physical and measurable is going on. And number eight, in both cases, this is said to ultimately have bearing on the question of God's existence. Wait, because I don't want to get too nitpicky on those, but I think I or a number of people could could look at it and say, well, a couple of those are, uh, there's some more ordinary prosaic kind of explanations for why those things might be coincidental, right? Not that that's uh, necessarily a bad example, but we could get into the fact that the fields are kind of related, the book was there, uh, you know, there's all these things. So is there another example you could maybe give us? Well, one example is uh, the one I begin the book with, which is a uh, CNP that I call the Bucket Brigade. And what's happening there is the Course in Miracle organization that I, that I work for uh, we're processing the issue of whether to um, basically take a departure in a new direction. And somebody comes up with this image of everybody in the organization forming a, a bucket brigade, you know, where everyone's working together, you're passing buckets of water along to, to put a fire out. Um, and rather than each of us doing sort of our separate thing in our separate space, we're all joined together in this really intense kind of common endeavor. And this suggestion is meant to be relevant to figuring out the organizational direction that you should go, right? 
That's exactly right. Yeah. And it, it, we were considering a departure in this direction. So what happened was at, at that moment, uh, we hear the sound of water and we, we were in a downstairs area in, in the house. We rushed into the other room and there's literally water pouring through the ceiling in, in a straight line. Uh, it turns out later we found that a, a, a washing machine repairman had been upstairs and he turned the wrong knob and there was water that, that came through an unfinished ceiling. And so everybody sprung into action, people in the meeting we were having, people who were working in the office upstairs. And the only thing to do was there was actually, right next to where the water was falling, a, a stack of plastic buckets. And so we had to essentially arrange these buckets in a straight line um, to catch the water in, until it could be turned off. And, you know, and everybody's joined together in this, and we're mopping it up and getting towels and everything. And, and of course, it was an intense experience, and it wasn't until we, we all – we're done with it, got back in the next room, took a breath, and we thought, hey, that was kind of weird. We just formed a line of, of water-filled buckets in response to an emergency in which everyone's pulling together in the organization, not in their separate spaces. It was exactly what we'd just been talking about in the meeting, but we, in this case, we'd had to actually carry out the exact thing we'd been talking about possibly doing. Great. So that's a very concrete example. They both are concrete examples that will give people an idea, I think, of what you're talking about. So maybe take just a minute and tell us about the the methodology that you use for trying to understand this, because that's what you break down in the book and in your paper. You know, that's what makes this a little bit different, as you alluded to in your first example. You're really trying to nail this down scientifically in a way that, that we can study it and, and try and understand it, right? So tell us a little bit about your methodology for understanding it. Right. Well, it is, as, as you're alluding, a very rule-based phenomenon. And I, I worked out the rules. I'm still working out the rules. But to the extent that I have, I've done it over 35 years and recording hundreds, I think, going on a thousand examples of it. The rules as I understand them are that you need those two events, you need the list of parallels. The parallels then will come together to tell a coherent story. They won't be a scattered list. And that coherent story will always be aimed at a relevant situation in your life. That situation will almost always be contained in one or both of the two events. So one of the events might be fictional. It might be like you mentioned the movie that you watched, but the other event will usually involve a situation that you're wrestling with. There may be some question involved. You may have made a decision about that, that you're still uncertain about. Um, it will be current. And so what happens is the parallels come together to tell a coherent story. And that story tends to frame that situation in a certain way and, and communicate a certain perspective on it. So that's one source of the meaning um, behind the CMPE. The other source is a little bit different, and it's not always operative, but in many CMPEs, one of the events literally involves that situation of relevance in your life. The other event eerily mirrors it, but involves a whole other situation that's not relevant for you. Like I said, it may be a fictional situation. Now, interestingly enough, the, the fictional or the non-relevant situation will usually tend to contain the answers to the questions in the real-life situation that, that concerns you. So you may be wondering what to do in your situation. In that other situation, what to do has already been done, and it's all resolved. So, so I call that the symbolic situation, and the symbolic situation then offers commentary on the uncertainties and the unresolved aspects of the literal situation. So what you do is you put together those two sources of meaning. The, the way the parallels frame the, the situation, which you call the subject situation, and then the way the symbolic situation frames that same situation. And when you put those together, you get a pretty clear message 
about your situation. And it's a message that different interpreters who know the rules will read in the same way. And that's something I've tested and experienced over and over again. You get two independent interpreters coming up with basically the same message. And that's what makes you feel that there's some realness to it. So you're you're coming along here saying, okay, if you take if you pay attention, you'll notice that these things happen in our lives. And then you throw this out there and people read it and hear about it and go, wow, you know, I never really quite noticed it. But yeah, there are these parallel events that have these a lot of coincidences that seem to be thematic or driven towards a problem and there's some realness to it. Okay, so that's really cool, I think, that you've identified this phenomenon and you've developed a methodology for trying to study it. And I guess that would get to this study that you've done, this pilot study. How will you find, kind of close the loop and really nail down that this is really happening? Yes, yeah, good question. Well, for me, you know, I've seen this happen on more or less a weekly basis for 30 years now, so I don't have my own doubts about it. Um, I've also worked with these events in the lives of quite a few other people that I know uh, for a long time as well. Uh, so from personal experience, I know it happens. And it's not just people, you know, very close to me. It's, I, I've read about these things in the lives of strangers. I had an instance a, a couple of months ago where um, an MDE researcher who's actually been on your show, she had one. We corresponded about it. She found the meaning surprising but really appropriate. So I've seen it happen so many times in so many lives, I don't have doubts about it. But obviously that's not good enough for somebody who's not me. So we did this pilot study, as you mentioned, in which we, we got 17 participants. And the whole point was to see, is this happening in the lives of people out there? And that was the entire goal of, of the study. So we taught them um, how to notice these events, and they recorded anything that seemed like it might be for a period of four months, sent them into me, and then we ran them through a, a 10 point scale to, that basically scores them to see if they, if they qualify. And we did find um, actually 16 genuine CMPEs through the study, which for me goes a lot, it, it, well, it's an initial study. You know, it's a pilot study. It's not going to, I think, establish the phenomenon for anybody who has any kind of skepticism, but uh, at least it, it's, it's a promising initial study suggestive of this being a general event that happens all over. And how would you measure statistically the odds against chance of these events occurring? How do you nail that part down? You know, I wish there was a way to do that. I, I don't personally believe there is a way to really measure the probabilities involved. I think it's too complicated. Uh, I think the strength of it comes in in reading the lists of parallels and and taken as a whole thinking, is it reasonable to suspect that that two events that were this parallel could come together purely by chance? The other thing, which to me really helps um, you know put out of consideration the skeptical alternative here, is that these things, in my experience, are never one-offs. A particular CMPE will always be part of, of a series. Other CMPEs will speak to the same situation and will say consistent things. In fact, similar CMPEs will often occur on the exact same date in different years, which is something I discovered and continues to kind of blow me away when it happens. Hmm. So, the, so different ones are intimately interrelated, and therefore you don't have to you have to explain away not just one, you have to explain away the whole series. And at some point, I think a reasonable a reasonable person stands there and says, "This just can't be chance." Right, and we should add because I can maybe glossed over that, but the the methodology that you have or that you applied in this study, for example, uh, is pretty rigorous. I mean, there's some definite rules that you mentioned that they have to follow and they have to be inside of a certain time frame and they have to follow other characteristics. And it's pretty, I think you said that you have an independent 
uh, judge or evaluator who can kind of say whether they meet that criteria. And, and anyone who reads the book, signs, or, or reads this study will see that it is quite objective in terms of how that's measured. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's really one of the key things about the phenomenon. Uh, I, I used to see patterns in all kinds of events and think they were coincidences around every corner. And, and as I went forward, I became personally quite skeptical about most synchronicities. I think personally that most of them are us connecting dots that aren't connected. That's just my personal opinion. Um, what I found was this phenomenon proved itself to me as real over time and showed that it had quite specific characteristics. And so that's how I've built the model and built the 10-point the scale for, for measuring them, trying to capture those specific characteristics. Without them, if they aren't there, you can tell this is not a real CMPE. So yes, yeah, very rigorous, which is quite different than the mindset we normally have around synchronicity. But the advantage, of course, is you can have some confidence that something real is going on here. And we aren't just connecting dots in a fanciful way. Okay, but you just hit on maybe the key phrase that I want to launch into is that something real is going on here. Of course, real is a very is the ultimate subjective term in terms of what's <laughs> reality. And I guess that gets us into how should we understand this phenomena. You and I in the email exchange before this were both referencing, you know, Daryl Bem's work, of course, because it gets at this issue of time and, and what is really our relationship with time. As I was reading through the science thing, I kept thinking, this is precognition in some way. So again, it gets to this time thing and we, we might be experiencing time uh, linearly, but the reality of time, may, it may not be uh, as linear as we think. So what are your thoughts on that? I Well, actually, I had a parapsychologist um, suggest something similar to me, that this is precognition. And I think that can work for some of the examples. I think it gets very strange for, for some of them as well, um, because in a lot of the examples, you have you have different people doing things at a distance. You know, somebody might send me an email. Um, in which case, you know, who's having the precognition? There are just there are just a lot of examples where I think that doesn't work that well. And what I want to say about trying to explain this, um, and obviously cries out for an explanation, is that in our attempt to explain it, I think there's two things that we should keep in mind. One is that we shouldn't just cherry pick certain elements of it and try to explain those and ignore the rest. And then the other is that we shouldn't come to it, I think, with the constraints of our particular worldview and say, well, only explanations within that worldview are okay here. I think we should look at the phenomenon as a whole and see what the phenomenon itself suggests in terms of you know, best explanations. And when I look at it as a whole, what I see is it looks like events are being somehow pulled together uh, in, in highly orchestrated ways and in ways that appear to be structured as communications. These things always highlight some situation in your life that you're dealing with, and then they provide a perspective on it a perspective that very often is targeted or seems to be targeted at the very things that you're wrestling with. So these things look like they are communications or structured as that. Um, so in my mind, an explanation would have to ideally honor that basic design of the phenomenon itself. So even now, Robert, you're creeping into this more controversial aspect of this, and it's in the title of the book, and it's also in the chapter in the book, and that's this idea of life's purpose and God's, the G words, plan. <laughs> you know, the last time, whenever I bring up the issue of God, and I usually talk about God as a placeholder for this idea of some organized consciousness, some higher level organized consciousness. Um, I get a lot of pushback. A lot of people are resistant to that. A lot of people feel 
very burned by Christianity is really what it usually comes down to, or mm -hmm. some other mm -hmm. uh, religion. But it's usually this idea that, hey, I was slammed with this Christian crap when I was a kid, and it took me 20 years of therapy to overcome it. Please don't try and shove God back down my throat. That's the pushback I get. And I have to say, there's a little bit of that that I felt here. I felt a need to push back a little bit, too. I mean, can yeah. we really make that leap that you're making and saying that because you see some kind of a relationship between the person that's experiencing the coincidence and some kind of structure, information, message in what they're experiencing it, can we really put God right in the middle of that? Well, I think, I think we don't have to. Um, you know, for me, there's a phenomenon here that needs to be explained. And for most of my time with it, I didn't see it as coming from God. Uh, I, my interest was really more practical. I was just wanting to work with it, get the benefits of it. And I kind of assumed it was coming from some wise place in my unconscious that could somehow maybe, you know, draw events together to get a message across to me. And I still think that's a reasonable explanation. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I've gone in the God direction personally. One is that I started to notice that if different people had CMPEs about the same situation, even people who were living, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles apart, their CMPEs would be consistent with each other and sometimes quite minutely related, as if they were coming from the same source. So I started to think, well, whatever the source is, it clearly transcends the individual mind, in which case maybe we can posit, uh, you know, a collective unconscious or something that is the source of these. And I think that would be consistent with the data as well. Let me nail that down a minute. So a collective unconscious, a collective consciousness would fit here. You, and, and then I guess the question related to that is, what is God for you in that continuum, if you will, of uh, if you're falling back to you know, the collective consciousness, then what is the relationship between your understanding of God and your understanding of this collective consciousness? Well, I don't, I don't really personally think that that collective unconscious explanation, the thing behind this, I'm saying I think it's a, re it's a softer interpretation that I think is reasonable. Um, I, I personally see it as coming from God. Um, my idea of God is, is very much what people experience, uh, for instance, in near-death experiences. Um, so I, you know, I, I see something, I, I see God as very much, you know, some kind of a, of a being who's maybe boundless and formless, but still, you know, alive and, in some sense, personal. I don't think that that's required at all to work with this phenomenon, to explore it. Um, I think that there's all kinds of possible explanations. But there's two things that I keep coming back to. One is the phenomenon itself pushes me in the direction of something godlike. Maybe it's something that falls short of being what we would call God. But the phenomenon itself, I think, suggests something godlike. Um, number two, a lot of what's pushed me in the extreme direction I've gone in is the CMPEs themselves. Um, I started to get them about oh, about 13 years ago. I started to get ones that clearly were saying they came from God, that the phenomena itself comes from God. And because I've built up a trust with, with these instances over many years, I, I kind of went with it. Hey, Robert, give me an example there. Nail that down for me. What do you mean you had a direct experience or message that this was coming from God? You know, as I said, the, the CMPEs, when you read them according to the rules, they end up communicating certain messages. I started to get the occasional CMPE whose message was, uh, actually, they, they were talking about me writing the book that I eventually wrote many years later, and they kept saying, essentially emphasize in the book, that this comes from God, and, and they even wanted me to end the book on that note. I know it sounds like an anthropomorphizing them, but that's just how I experience them. They're, they're giving me messages. Um, so I, I do relate those in the book. Um, one of them was where I was writing to somebody a long account of my understanding of the phenomenon. 
um, you know, that was their first encounter with it. And I was talking about how, you know, it's a strange thing because it looks like, you know, in a skeptical age, it looks like here is something that, that seems to come from, from God or God's plan or something in that direction. Um, and, you know, it seems like it's God speaking to us, even though we aren't listening. Um, and right after that, I ended up watching a, a TV program. I, I used to be in the X-Files, and so it was an episode of the X-Files, um, in which the show, which I caught the very tail end of, concludes on an uncannily similar note. Um, the One of the main characters has been experiencing amazing events over the course of the show, and she ends up feeling like, you know, God is speaking and, and no one's listening. Um, so it was things like that that started to push me in a direction that I actually hadn't gone in quite yet. Um, and when I did do what they said and make that the ending of the book, I had, as a confirmation of that, one of the most spectacular CMPs I'd ever had. There were about 30 parallels, which I made the epilogue of the book eventually. Um, and so so they've, they've actually helped take me there even though I'm adamant that you don't need to start there or even end there um, to look with the phenomena and think something's happening. Tell us how that's informed your understanding of God on a personal basis. What, what do you take away, big picture-wise, in terms of what this means about God and how God is involved in your life? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I've been asked that before. Uh, the background is I, I do I, I do really take these seriously as the most important um, the most authoritative influence in my own personal decision making. They don't happen on command, they don't happen every day, but when they do happen, I take them very seriously. And to a large degree, I live my life by them. Um, they, they have proven themselves very trustworthy. That's why, actually, I'm, I'm living in England now. As I, I, I had CMPEs telling me to move here with my, with my family. Um, so as a result of their influence, I basically feel like there is something, which is usually quite anonymous, that there's something that is advising me, that wants me to move in, in positive directions that end up being healthy and, and good for me and for those around me. Whatever this is, is concerned about small situations in my life. I was told to, after 25 years, go back and, and see the dentist. Um, and large ones, my, my spiritual development, um, my work, my, my close relationships. Whatever this is seems really concerned about every aspect of my life and really intent on giving me clarity and, and vision for those different areas in my life. Um, and so a lot of my own tangible sense uh, of God comes from the feeling that there's just something looking out for me and wanting to impart to me the clarity and, and the wisdom and sometimes even the foresight that can help me along my way. So I, I end up actually feeling very cared for. So where do you go from here, Robert? Where do you go with the research, with the results of the pilot study, and where would you like to see the, the, the research into the phenomena go? Yeah, I, I really want to see this go somewhere. Um, the CMPEs themselves, they think this is going to be some kind of field of inquiry one day. Um, along the lines of near-death studies. I think we're quite a long ways off from that, to be honest. But they, they have a very long-range point of view, so I'm not going to be surprised if that happens. I think that the next step is is just to keep studying it. We've got to, um, I think, this time get a funded study uh, we, that we can construct very carefully using what we learned from the first study, have very tight controls, uh, deal with questions like independence, which is one of the big bugaboos here. Were the events really independent? Um, and uh, just do it more carefully, you know, more independent uh, scores and observers. Uh, and just slowly, I think, try to push it out there. My experience is that this is such a different sort of phenomenon than we're currently studying and different than how we think of synchronicity, that I think people have a hard time just getting it to kind of click into place in their brains. 
And along those lines, do you have any thoughts on why certain people are experiencing CMPEs and others are not or anything like that? That's obviously a really important question. And it's, it's clear to me that different people, my wife and I call them sign magnets. Different people are real sign magnets. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, I get a, a, a great deal of them more than other people I know. I don't know why that is. I'm not a psychic person. I'm not a person given to spiritual experiences. I'm a, I'm a really classic left brain guy. But some get more, and some seem to never get them. Right. Uh, the woman in our study, one woman out of 17 people who got virtually a third of all the recorded examples that we right. had, and she's an nde ear. And I, I, I somehow connect it with that. But she and I are very different kinds of people. She's totally right brain and totally left brain. So I'm not really sure what attracts them to some and not others. It's interesting just to kind of speculate. Uh, the, the NDE that you mentioned, you know, opening people up psychically. Uh, I'd be interested in people who experience precognitive dreams or other kind of uh, of paranormal experiences, what their relationship is or frequency of having these sign experiences. There's all sorts of interesting questions. It certainly is uh, refreshing that you're approaching this from both a personal, spiritual aspect, which I think is very brave on your part, and at the same time pursuing it on a parallel path that asks these questions scientifically. And I think there's uh, there's some great great work to be done there too. So it's it's just really great. And I hope people dig into it. And I'm sure that this will generate a lot more CMPEs from people. I think it's the kind of thing that once you hear about it, uh, you see them much more than you would than before when you didn't know about it. I'm sure you have plenty of stories of that, right? It's true. And they are very easy to overlook because some are obvious, but some... For some, you have to have a kind of a pattern state of mind where you're looking for not a single striking thing, but for that whole pattern. And those can blow by very easily. I like the the forward to the book because I felt the same way. You know, there's this, at first, there's this kind of desire to push against it and go, no, 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 no. But then the more you dig into it, I I think it's it's rather remarkable that you've kind of identified this little paranormal phenomena that... I'm sure other people have kind of seen, but no one's really nailed down in the way that you have. So that's most of our paranormal events that we're studying now, they're inner experiences with hopefully a veridical component. But in the end, they say they seem to say something about our abilities um, or our ultimate nature being perhaps immaterial, but with science or CMPEs, they their statements seem to be more about something other than us that seems to be, you know, giving us messages. Right, and uh, it's interesting what you just said about the empirical aspect of it. I, I, let's explore that a little bit further, and maybe I'll roll this back into the show, but tell us how you think there's a little bit of a, a difference there in how we experience this, as opposed to like an out-of-body experience. Well, you know, with an out-of-body experience, that is an internal experience that at best, you know, has some veridical component to it. You see something out of the body that you couldn't have seen if you were in the body. But fundamentally, it's a subjective, you know, inter interior experience. Um, with CNPEs, one of the things that makes them so different from other things that we're studying in terms of the paranormal is these are objective physical events. Just to nail that down a little bit, so when you're in the water brigade, you're in the water brigade with 10 other people, or five, however many there are, and they can all right. say, yes, that really happened. When you have the experience of being inside the Simpsons episode of the Krusty the Clown <laughs> episode, right. then every millions of people can watch the Krusty the Clown episode and say, yeah, that really happened, and they could have videotaped you out at the park and said, yeah, that same thing happened. So there is this this difference there, isn't there? Right, and a lot of the events of CMPEs I found through going back and checking are recorded. They're emails, they're, they're a television show, they're things that don't rely on people's reporting. So here we have objective, often recorded 
physical events, um, that, you know, we have to explain how they came together while being so unbelievably similar. And so in the end, the, the, you know, the, the import of the phenomenon is a bit different than with something like an out-of-body experience or an NDE or, or past life memory, where those things are suggestive of, of unusual human abilities or suggestive of perhaps you know, our ultimate nature as humans. Maybe we're immaterial and can survive death. This phenomenon instead is suggestive, it seems to me, of something other than us something that seems to be sending us messages, whether that be God or something else like a collective unconscious or, you know, who knows, you know, aliens, whatever. I'm just not quite sure that we can make that last leap because there's this whole idea, one of time that we talked about and precognition, but also just in terms of being you and I and whoever being co-creators of our reality. So we get back to this idea of what's reality and how is reality being created and experienced, and again, what's our relationship to time? Are we in the future creating our reality of the past? I mean, but I do get your point. You know, we, we shouldn't act like anything's definitive yet. However, I think that there is a contemporary bias, um, even among those of us who are into the paranormal, a bias against sort of agents that are beyond the human. Mm. Um, you know, maybe uh, if we take NDE seriously, for instance, it looks like that experience um, involves a certain amount of initiative from the other side. Maybe something coming to the human level from the other side is part of how life works. Great. Well, the book again is Signs. We'll have a link to it up here on the website. Robert, it's been great having you on. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to Robert Perry for joining me today on Skeptico. You know, there's a couple of questions that I'd pull out of this interview and ask for your response on. Love to hear your opinion on these. The first has to do with synchronicity. You know, we've never talked about it on this show, so perhaps it'd be interesting to hear your experiences with it, whether you think it's real, whether you think it's a pattern matching brain kind of thing, which it certainly is in some cases, but is there any realness to it? Does it ever go beyond the normal to the paranormal? And the second question I teed up has to do with this point that Robert made at the end, which I think is a fascinating point, and that is, is there a bias against theories that suggest this hand of God kind of phenomena? And as Robert points out, it doesn't always have to be God up on a cloud or anything like that, but this idea that there may be these external, non-physical influences that are directing our life in a certain way. Is there a built-in bias against even considering theories like that. I think that's a really interesting point. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. The way to share those thoughts are either through the Skeptico forum, on the website, email to me, Facebook to me, all that stuff you can find at the Skeptico website. It's at skeptico.com, and there you'll also find links to all our previous shows so you can get caught up on all the back episodes of Skeptico. It's always so fun to get emails from people who say, hey, I just stumbled across the show and I found that there's all these back episodes and I'm listening to them and you can kind of re-experience them going through and going through the same journey that I've been on over these four or five years now in doing Skeptico. So if you are inclined to do that or you know someone who'd like to maybe listen to some of those old shows, please tell them about it. That's what they're there for. So with that, I just want to let you know I have a number of shows coming up. I'm going to probably be bringing them out every week for a while because I do have several in the hopper and I need to get caught up so I can do some more interviews because I have so many interviews out there that I want to do. So you might have to pick up your pace of skeptical listening for a while here. So with that, do take care and bye for now.